So we go on with our uh, work, and uh, I'm going to tell you about the last last components of conformal filtry, which we need to know. And then after that, we use this knowledge to analyze analyze the uh, various aesthetic models, which we come across. So. Conformal filter, it's, I had said this before, but I will recap. So I construct the Hilbert space by taking some a state of weight H, which has the property, it's the eigenvector of the L0 operator, and it is vanished by all Ln positive N operators. And then the Verma module is formed by states like this. So that you, you from this H, you take, you go down by multiplying my L minus Ns. And you can multiply as many of them as you like. Um, but each combination forms a, <coughs> forms a level. The level is such that, so you have H and your level is such that you have an N here. N here could have been produced by L minus 1 to the power N or by a simple L minus 1 or any combination in between. So that all these Ks which they which are used to produce a, a state of level N, they sum up to N. Therefore, the number of ways I can do it is the partition of N. Partition of N is defined as the total number of ways you can add up digits to sum of for to sum up to n So I have a Verma module starting with H at the top, the grandfather, and then his children. All his children come below. And at any level, you have here Pn states. This I call a Verma module. It's a subspace of the Hilbert space, which has been constructed like this. And therefore, and I will therefore have one for H bar, treating H bar not as the complex conjugate of H, but as an independent number from H. So H and H bar are two numbers. Both of them are, in, uh, in this case, real. Um, And then I take a direct product. So for H and H bar, I have a direct product, and then add up all of them over all H and H bar. And this will give me my Hilbert space. So in this way, a Hilbert space is constructed. And I have the operators already on acting on the Hilbert space, which is uh, which I had already defined as, as the field operators. So that almost completes my work, yes. It's not irreducible. Uh, this, this, uh, this, if they were irreducible, we, our work would have been finished. But they are not irreducible, as far as I have explained. So if, if these were irreducible, I would have now had a fully functional Hilbert space. 
The problem is that if it is not irreducible, if it is reducible, then it's possible that you have sections of it which rotate among them themselves. And if I have this situation, it really means is that I have another Verma module which I have not considered. So I have to extract all these things out of them and just uh, I be then just left with irreducible modules and then I sum over all the irreducible modules to get the Hamiltonian, uh, to get the Hilbert space. Yeah? Okay, I talked about this state operator formalism that presumably this H state is related to the vacuum by some opera field operator phi of H and then I will have a correspondence between H and phi of H. So if I construct a uh, Verma module for the H, correspondingly there will be a set of operators associated with this uh, structure. So I have all the fields, which I, all the field operators which I need also, and basically solves my fundamental problem, which is a set, a, a Hilbert space and a set of operators acting on. Then I can go on to do my calculations. And uh, first calculation which we can do relatively easy is that we take the two-point function of two operators like that. Um, and I showed you that simple, simply by symmetry you can derive this. I didn't show it to you completely because the last, last step I left out, which was the inversion, but you can do that yourselves, it's, uh, and you get this for. The same trick can be used to get the three-point function. The three-point function is fixed up to this constant C, and this constant C will not be known unless you specifically tell me which conformal field theory I'm dealing with, and then I can extract the Cs for them. The next step is the four-point function, the same the same game is played with the four-point function, and you get this these, uh, structure which has the right uh, scaling properties. But the problem with four-point function is that you then have this cross-ratio. This cross-ratio, you can show, is invariant on the conformal transformations, and therefore it is possible to have a function of eta multiplying this uh, set. And I don't have any way of determining f of eta unless I, you, you give me something more about the theory. So some sort of differential equation that this must satisfy. And then I can derive f. Higher point fu functions will be much harder because when you have five points, you have more than one cross ratio, and then uh, you have a function of two un unknown variables in the front. Yes, two independent. <coughs> I cannot. <laughs> um, yeah, it's a. Uh, I cannot, it sort of needs a presence of mind, which I don't have. <coughs> um, fine. So, we come to the point of the The, the problem that there may be the, uh, the the, there may be irreducible sub spaces of this module.
And uh, the argument goes like this. You have here n vectors which arrive out of uh, this structure, which I call a level. P n vectors sit here. And it's not, I didn't give a proof, and it's actually not true that all of them are independent of each other. So it's possible that some vectors within this set may be related to each other. To give an example, the best thing is to look at the level two, the simplest. Level is level two, and here for level two, I have just two vectors. I have an L minus two of H and an L minus one squared of H. And if they are not independent of each other, there may exist a linear relationship among them. Suppose such a relationship can be found. Then what have I found? I have found an operator which annihilates H. So here, notes that I have an operator which, if it hits H, H is vanished, vanishes H. Therefore, H is a null state in the sense that there is an operator that kills it. So what does this mean? It means that the, I don't really have two independent states. I just have one independent state at this level. And uh, when I come down from H, I cannot create all that comes under H, but just only the ones which come out of one of the independent operators. Hence, existence of such a relationship gives me uh, gives me the ability to look for values of H which satisfies this that. So for all H, this is not satisfied. But there are special values of H for which this relationship is satisfied. This is the example for the Ising model. I will tell you in a minute that I can then I can associate conformal field theories to a statistical models, and uh, each of these models is uh, is uh, identified by a number of states. There is a state of weight one half in the Ising model, which satisfies this relationship, and therefore. Finding values of H, which satisfies the null state, will also give me, will, give, will serve two purposes. One is that I will find my irreducible uh, towers and complete my construction. And the other is that since it doesn't happen for all values of H, I will find a specific value of H for which this is satisfied and hence identify my conformal field theories specifically. So once you do that, you find a whole series of H values which give you um, null states. And these are all the H values which give you null states for values of C between 0 and 1. And this proof was completed by Katz uh, quite a while ago. And it's a rather involved proof. I don't really want you to know the proof. What we are looking at conformal field theory in a, in a 
applicable way. So instead of going for the proofs, we want to know how we can use this knowledge. So there are states for each value of C, the central charge. Then there are a number of weights which are given here, which give rise to null states. And then these, in fact, identify each verma module which I have to construct. And when I construct all the verma modules for each C, I have the complete Hilbert space. And I have my conformal field theory. So instead of the proof, let's just analyze the numbers which have come out here. Um, I have a, I gave you a sort of half-baked argument that C has to be positive. Uh, one, another argument is added to that, that for this kind of construction, C has to be bigger, uh, smaller than one. So I need to have C smaller or equal to one or bigger or than equal to zero. This then tells me that C is equal to one minus six divided by M times M plus one, and M can be any number from two upwards. So at M equal to two, C is exactly zero. And I gave an argument yesterday that this is a, um, an empty CFD, or it's a trivial CFD. Trivial in the sense that it just has the operator one as the operator contact. Then I can take M equal to three, and C comes out to be one half. If, for that case, then I have one conformal weight of one half and conformal weight of one sixteen. If you work this out, because when m is equal to three, p can take three values, and q takes values between sorry, p p can take two values and q takes values between one and p. So you have a a tra uh, just three possible states for various values of P and Q, and these three possible states are these guys. And hence, you just continue with other C values and other M's. Finally, um, we now try to identify what these states are, these states which we have here. So this, this numbers imply that for, I have uh, one state which is P equal to one, Q equal to one, and that is the vacuum state. It has to be, because it has zero weight. Then the next state comes out of P equals to two Q to one, and then another state P equals to two Q equals to two. We don't know yet, but we will, I will tell you that this is the case, that these, this theory, this theory of C equals to one half corresponds to the Ising model. So these two states have to correspond to the state to what you can construct in the, in the Ising model. And it is easier to identify it with operators than states. So this uh, and this state are two states, one half and one sixteenth, which correspond to the operators of the Ising model. And we have no choice. We just have two operators in the Ising model which we can um, call upon one is the spin and the other is energy density. And so on. We have to continue this game for 
every m. This is the simplest m. And uh, we then find a table. The table continues for all m. I have only written the first four. So the following statistical models come out. The Ising model, the tricritical Ising model, three-state parts model, tri tricritical three-state parts model, and so on. Hmm? What do you mean all include? All what? No, 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 not all statistical mechanical systems, no. Sorry, I can't hear you. I don't, sorry, I have to say that sentence something somehow other, some, some other way. I cannot understand what your meaning is. I think the question is something like, would a three-dimensional Ising model will also correspond to n equal to three conformal features? Okay, the three, if that is the question, the three-dimensional Ising model, because it is three-dimensional, will not be in this table. So it is possible that there is some other conformal field theory, but a three-dimensional conformal field theory, which will correspond to the three-dimensional Ising model, although it's not, it's not found yet. But another question it could be that can you then, for every two-dimensional critical model, find the corresponding conformal field theory? And the answer is no. <laughs> there are. And we, we have found for a no, large number of them, but not all. However, it's a matter of belief, I guess, uh, that whether you believe that this procedure is robust enough to find everything. Central charge has a physical interpretation in that uh, it's related to the energy density of the system, but it's a, it's a very loose interpretation. Um, so here I can ask a very, very interesting question. Suppose I put as this top state the vacuum, right? Then the question is, what are the states which I can construct as the descendants of the vacuum state? So I come down, the first thing that can act on the vacuum is L minus one. So level one, you only have L minus one of zero. And this has to be zero. Because L minus one is just D by DZ. And what this says is that the vacuum is translationally invariant. But also it tells me that this is my knowledge state in this value, in this Verma module, because I, I now have a relationship like that of the knowledge state, but it's a very simple one. An operator acting on H is giving zero. Next question is, suppose the next state level will be created by L minus two on vacuum. And note that L minus one squared gives you zero. So in, at this, a stage now I have just one state. And the reason that this is happening is because on top of it I have a null state. So the Verma module is somehow reduced. Now this state L minus two is an interesting state because yesterday I did a simple calculation which I showed that the central charge is related to the norm of this state. So, so 
In fact, this central charge is given by this, the norm of this state. And uh, worse than that, if this vanishes, C vanishes, and then the entire conformal filter will be empty, which will be this possibility when C vanishes. So in some sense, C is telling you that there is some content in your theory. Now, it's, it's a little overstating to say that it's the energy density. There's some content in your theory. Sometimes C is negative. Sometimes C is negative. Then, then uh, we have a non-unitary theory. If, if you have a negative C, this means that the norm of this guy is negative. And having a Hilbert space with negative normed states means that you have a non-unitary theory. But doesn't mean that it's not physical. Um, so in this box, values of C lower than one half are not written. But there are two other values which are famous, and of course there are other as possible states. This gives me the percolation model. And this gives me the abelian sandpile. They are both respectable models in, in statistical mechanics and very well studied. They come out, one comes out of a negative norm CFD, and the other one comes out of a theory which should have been, should have been trivial, but is not. So this is not the only possibility for C equals to zero. I can construct a C equal to zero theory, but non-unitary. This emptiness is imposed if you impose unitarity as well. And there are other C equal to minus one C negative theories. Um, and these are non-unitary. In general, it's very, it's a, a, it's a Pandora's box. Once you open the door, to the possibility of having non-unitary states, then you have removed one of your conditions views which you used for proof of things, and then it is very difficult to work out the operator content and so on of these theories. And therefore, these theories are still, there is still a space for work to work, to work out the operator content of these theories. Um, I will not go into that. It's a very difficult problem. But the nice and clean result is this, that I have a number of models which connect up to CFT. OK, the good news is that I'm not going to tell you anything more about the CFT. As I said in this lecture and a half, is all we are going to need <coughs> to, for, for, the, for the purpose of this lecture. So next step is to, um, to analyze a few, a few systems which we are familiar with. So two very famous models I'm going to analyze with all these machinery which I have introduced. And it has two purposes, this part. This is a trig to, through doing these two examples, what I will get is 
uh, a working knowledge of the concepts which have been given so far and see and, and, and also see how they are implemented in case of these two models. The good thing about these two models is that we already know a lot about them. So let's try and do this. The first point is uh, Ising model. The 2D Ising model is a, is a network of a spins. A spins are set on the nodes and they can be parallel or anti-parallel. Parallel, parallel is, has, a, has a lower energy, so the tendency is to go to parallel state. I can write an, a Hamiltonian for it in this shape. Sigma i are spins sitting on nodes. Each i is a, is, a, is a compound index, so it refers to a specific point on the plane. And uh, the way it is written is that two neighboring states, two neighboring uh, spins, when they multiply each other, and if they are in the same state, they will, it will be positive. So sigma i can be plus or minus one, so if they are sitting next to each other in the same direction, two plus ones, this will be a one, and lower energy. Sometimes I need to add an external magnetic field, which is given in this shape. Something which, I, a model which I'm sure you know, so we don't need to spend a lot of time on it. At h equals to zero, the Hamiltonian is invariant under the action of the group Z2s when you change the sign of all the spins. The order parameter is the mean magnetization given in this form. And it's clear that this guy vanishes due to the Z2 symmetry because you take Z sigma to minus one, sigma m goes to minus m and the only solution for m therefore is zero. But we know that for H equal to zero, at temperatures below Tc, magnetization is non-zero. And this is the approximate, this is the, the exact form and it's approximately 2.26. So what happens? M magnetization again of the Ising model is zero above Tc and non-zero below Tc, and uh, it deviates from zero near Tc by this exponent, beta. Okay, here is an example of ergodicity breaking, and the thing is that at below Tc, the entire phase space is not available to your to your calculations, and you have to take a mean over only half of the phase space. So if you are, for instance, in the, in the domain that spins are directed up, you just use the, use the states which can be obtained from this state by a, by a finite number of um, flips. Or in other words, sorry, I shouldn't say a finite number, by a finite energy, because each flip needs, a, a, it's, needs an energy to, to go, to change, and then a finite uh, energy means that you can only change so many of these spins to the down, and when you just add up on that, magnetization will be non-zero. So in, think of it in this term, that we take the phi plus, a state as our ground state, and then we assume some sort of dynamics which takes you away from this phi plus, and the phase space is created by the long time action of these dynamics. It's a sort of practical phase space which is connected to one of the vacuum. And when you, when you just sum over this phase space, magnetization will be non-zero. And this is a case of ergodicity breaking in the 2D Ising model. When, when I talked about the two ergodicity breaking, 
here we see that below TC, the Ising model phase space is broken into two parts. Those which are connected to the positive ground state and a completely different section connected to the negative ground state. And uh, hence, if you add up magnetization only on this section, it is non-zero and it loses its symmetry. You can no longer change all the sigmas to negative because those are those fall into this part of the phase space. So he, this is a, a, a clear example of what I mean by ergodicity breaking. I can also calculate ex, a critical exponents for the Ising model, <coughs> and they are given in this table. There is an exact calculation in two dimensions. The 3D Ising doesn't have an exact solution yet, so num sim uh, numerical simulations have produced exponents for the 3D Ising model. And in four dimensions, we believe that the Ising model has a good approximation in the, by the mean field theory, so these are the exponents of the mean field theory approach to the Ising. The other concept which I introduced was renormalization group techniques. So let's see what can we can do in this case. For RG, um, what we can do in a spin model is follow Kadanov's block diagonalization. That is, you take a number of spins, in this case four of them, you add them up and set them in the middle of the square. So in this way, the number of spins which you are dealing with is reduced because four has gone to one, and the size of the unit cell has also increased because you now these two spins are two A apart, whereas these were only one A apart. This gives me a procedure by which I can implement the renormalization group because I am, going, I am changing the scale from 1a to 2a and I can see what happens to my theory as a result of that. What I have to do is then look at the interactions in the Hamiltonian and see if, how the interactions in the Hamiltonian change as a result of this block resummation. The problem is that it's actually very hard to do any of this in practice. And so there is this famous sentence by Michael Fisher, which actually doesn't say anything. It just says it's difficult. <laughs> it's, uh, Michael Fisher was one of the instigators of RG and uh, what he's actually saying that the actual process of explicitly doing this is non-trivial. No, so it says that it is non-trivial. Why do you say it doesn't say anything? So, I'm sorry? You said that it doesn't say anything. It says that it is non-trivial. Okay. <laughs> um, so, what I'm going to try and do is to actually do it now for a simpler model, or not simpler, for the Ising model sitting on the triangular lattice. And uh, it's, a, it's a process which is very interesting in that one can actually see the ex explicitly how this resummation process happens. And it's a very good, it gives you a very good understanding of RG. So let's take uh, Ising model on a triangular lattice. So I have a triangular lattice 
spins are sitting here. What I then do is that I take a resummation process, which means that I take these three spins, add them up, and then take its sign. What is uh, usually a difficult thing to do is that in your resummation, you want to at least ensure that your dynamic variable takes on the same range of um, the same range of the original dynamical variable. So if I call the new spin this, this thing, it will have the same range. So I define a new spin which is the sign of this sum. And all the various combinations which you can take here f from three ones down to three minus ones will definitely have a specific sign. Note that if I had a, a, an even number of them, a zero would have become possible, which would have thrown me out of the Ising model. It would give you three values. This is why this trick is so neat that uh, when you take just three spins, you always have either plus or minus one. And therefore, what I do is that I take this rule and then set a spin in the middle, which I will color separately, and this is sigma i. So in this graph, I hope it is, or in this shape, it's, I hope it is obvious that this has uh, happened, that uh, three spins are added up and one spin sits in the middle, which is on this, on this new point, and also one at this new point. <coughs> so what happens is that you have a distance A prime between the new spins, which is in fact this line here, as opposed to a distance between all the spins, which was A. And A prime is related to A um, I think that's an error must be multiplied by root of three. And the other thing which happens is that the number of plaquettes, that is faces which have which the complete faces, changes by n divided by three when you do this. It's obvious that the number of plaquettes decreases because these guys occupy bigger plaquettes. And then what happens is that as a result of this process, the Hamiltonian changes. And so I should be able to write it as uh, interacting terms for HIs, which forms, me, forms the new Hamiltonian, and then terms which forms the, uh, if you like, the magnetic field action on the Hamiltonian, which is this guy here. And, when, and then I can write the old Hamiltonian as a sum over two different types of spins, SI and SI, a small SI. I have, <coughs> I have to clarify something here. You see, Hamiltonian is written as the sum over, well, my notation from slides to here has changed, minus beta h of sigma i to start with. But then I sum some of these spins, 
and I should be able to then write it as a minus b over h si when I do that. So let's wrap this up. If I now do this summation and whenever I have three spins, Then something is summed up here, but not everything. You have some leftover variables still here because you have summed them up with some imposed condition. So you now have a new Hamiltonian in terms of new spins. And if I now sum all of these with respect to SI, I should get the same partition function. Okay. So what now I have to do is to see what the Hamiltonian will look like after this resummation. And this is the, the, the really the non-trivial non part of the a statement by Michael Fisher that to actually get out the new Hamiltonian is not an easy thing. But in this case, there is a trick which makes it easy, but in a, some sort of an approximation. Exactly, exactly, exactly. So, what you say is true. I have now two types of interaction. Interactions which are among the spins within the same triangle. Interactions of spins within the same triangle. So these spins have interactions with each other. And this is easier to deal with because I am summing up over these three spins and put a spin in the middle. Then there are interactions between neighboring triangles from here to there. So for the moment, I'm going to ignore the interactions which are intertriangular. I will just look at the intertriangular interactions, and that's easy. So I, I. Uh, Mark these guys by I, if you like. And uh, for each of these set, I have interactions between these three spins. Let's work that out. Now, to rest your mind, um, This means that the Hamiltonian is divided into two parts. One Hamiltonian, which comes from the intracell interactions, plus a Hamiltonian, which comes from um, intercell interactions. And this is the trick which makes this problem solvable. That is, you make a division which we call inter the main Hamiltonian and the interaction around it. 
the interaction around it is not necessarily a smaller interaction, but it is a, somehow a simplifier of the problem. So I can, in fact, now forget about the interaction and just do this guy. And this is easy to do because um, we can just count the number of states and work out the Hamiltonian for it. Hmm? Is that Hamiltonian uh, after the, the renormalization or uh, before the renormalization? No, at the moment before the renormalization. Okay. This Hamiltonian is the usual Ising Hamiltonian, except that I have broken the interactions into intercell and intracell interactions. It's just a rearrangement. Okay. But now I'm going to forget about that, keep this one only, and that is not the usual Ising Hamiltonian. So now for one cell, I have all possible spins. So it's sigma 1, sigma 2, sigma 3, all belonging to the cell I. You can write them down, and they will have possible states. Corresponding to this, I have a sigma i, which, has, which is using this rule. So these three sigmas can take various values, and then sigma i can take a value, which is, in this case, plus, 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 minus, and so on. And now I have e to the power minus beta h0 because I'm keeping only this term. And this gives me some values 3 to the power k, e to the power minus k, minus k, minus k. So this last one is 3K. K would be beta J. H0 is minus J sigma I sigma J. So H0 is the sum of spins, neighboring spins, but I am only keeping spins within the same cell. So it's not all of the spins. Hmm. Last line is infinite. Last line is what? You are right. This is... Minus k. And so on.
So this z0 guy now is equal to e to the minus beta h0 somewhere all the spins. But now because the spins are deco have decoupled from each other, it actually is just somewhere all i e to the minus beta h but this is over only one cell and this happens because the cells are no longer coupled to each other as in the normalizing they are now decoupled so I can actually calculate this simply by looking at this last column which is e to the power 3k plus 3e to the minus k. Which is just the sum of these, these terms here. I should really organize this a little bit better. So if you complete the table, you will see that this is repeated. This will then be repeated for the, for the other four. Hence, this partition function is really this guy and uh, to some power. So this is the value of z0 now. What is left is what happens to the H interaction. H interaction will have terms which are a multiplication of two different cells. So this guy, H interaction, is equal to K times spins from different cells. Should have what, sorry? We should have a coefficient equal to two in the partition function. Um, you mean we should have a, a two to the power n over three here? Yes, I think. Okay, that's a possibility, but it doesn't change much because these these coefficients. Don't, ma don't matter in the calculation. Or when you say that you work for the partition function with a given value of sigma big i, then the weight is only this much. For each value of big sigma, for the block,
Yes. 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 Then there is no factor of two. Then there will be no factor of two. So now I want, what I want is this e to the minus beta h of sigma i, which is equal to e to the power minus beta h0 minus beta h interaction. And I can write this down in the following way. I now actually interpret this as interaction and expand it. So it gives me an e to the minus beta h0 for the first term plus or minus, uh, minus beta h interaction e to the minus beta h0, etc. Let us also divide by Z0. This is the Z0. So it comes out to be 1 plus the expectation value of the H interaction. And then, of course, I have second order terms. Etc. As you can guess, I'm not going to calculate these. Since this is a perturbation, I may be able to get a good enough answer by calculating just the first interaction. Of course, um, the inventors of this method, which are these guys, I think I should write them, write their name, however, and van uh, Leuven. These two guys invented this method to actually see, that is to answer Michael Fisher's dilemma that the process is non-trivial. It surely is non-trivial. But they managed to calculate H squared as well. I will only present H because it's much easier and takes less time. However, uh, it can be taken to the, to the next level. Yeah. So the H uh, interaction that you're writing there is uh, the one after the renormalization? Yes. And why can you say that it is small? So that you can do perturbation? OK, that's a good question. Why can I say that it is a small? Um, it's a small because there are really look, the number of interactions which are formed between cells is is not many, and I I I am hoping that 
all these interactions which are formed between these two cells, somehow in this block resummation will have a smaller effect because it becomes thin, thinned out. Not, not all of them will be relevant. Some of them will be uh, simply summed up. But it's, it's a hope. It really comes out of the a smartness of these guys that they managed to show that this actually makes a small contribution. And, and you can only see that at the end. Here, I'm only making a hand, at this stage, I can only make a hand-waving argument that each, each of these terms which come out of that expansion are small, smaller in respect to the previous one. You kind of can see it because all, all the, all, a lot of interactions are taken into account here, and then there are inter-spin interactions between here and there, here and there, which, which determine, so there are two interactions here between these two, which determines the, this cell with that cell. But is this the same reason because uh, we neglect the interaction term before doing the renormalization? Because you, you dropped no, renormalization has not happened yet. All, all I have done is that I have defined a block resummation. We don't know anything about renormalization yet. So what I'm, the, the general plan of this calculation is like this. In any resummation, what you do is that you define a resummation rule which I have defined here. In the previous slide, a different resummation rule was defined. And if you have ever tried to do that, you see that this is a very difficult rule to implement. People have done it, but on a, on a blackboard and in front of a class, this one is easier to do. So the question is, can I have a simpler uh, resummation rule such, such that I can actually do the calculation? I define a resummation rule, which is this guy here. And then what, happen, what I have to do is to, to then show that the new Hamiltonian is of this form. It hasn't lost its Ising personality or, or identity. It, it's of the, almost the same shape as the previous sizing with Wilbur, it will not be exactly the same. The interaction terms will become more complex, and they co there will be more coefficients of coupling constants. But that is good for me because that will give me then that will give me the renormalization group. The renormalization group equations are equations which connect the neck, the new coefficients to the old coefficients. Okay, but my point is that. Uh Writing the Hamiltonian, uh, dividing intra and uh, intercell uh, interactions uh, is quite uh, arbitrary how you choose the cells because you can uh, rotate the cells uh, and uh, those interaction. Uh, yes, you are right. And yes. most of the interactions actually are in uh, the parts you are neglecting. No, that's not true. Because one Most of is uh, interacting with the uh, other uh, six around, uh, you are uh, neglecting four out of six, isn't it? No, these, these spins are interacting with each other very strongly. And then there is this interaction of this spin with its neighbors, which will determine the interaction of this triangle and that triangle. Just counting them around one uh, for one triangle is, is, appears to be less than this. So I'm taking most of the interactions in. However, you are right in the sense that this is completely arbitrary, completely arbitrary. And there is no reason to assume that this will always work. It just happens to work so that we can see the effect of it. It's, a, you know, it's, it's an example for in practice where you can see how this resummation works and you can derive the renormalization group equations finally as you connect the coefficients of this guy to that guy. You can make the calculation more precise, that is, you include more and more effects 
by taking the higher order perturbations, which people have done. As, uh, and you then hope for the higher order perturbations to be smaller than the first order perturbation. And that hope is only uh, justified after we do all the calculations, <laughs> not before. Because before your argument is correct and uh, you can say, okay, if this is not true in all statistical mechanical models which I can separate in this sense and get, and you'll you be right. Just, just a, a smart example for seeing an effect to, to, where you can actually perform all the calculations. Yeah? Go on. Now the interaction term is like that. And now I want to take the mean of this thing. Where I and J, each one belong to neighboring cells. <coughs> but this mean is taken over Z0, which is, which is this guy. So I should put a Z0 here as well. Now, here is the beauty of the trick, and that is this guy will now the mean because it doesn't connect, because H0 doesn't connect the different cells, will just be like that. The Hamiltonian doesn't con connect the different cells. So the mean of operators which are in different cells will be independent of each other. So what I therefore need to calculate is sigma i averaged over zero, and this is what it comes out to be. So if sigma i is equal to one, I go and look at the table which I rubbed off and see where does sigma i equal to 1 for which combinations? And then count, calculate that combination. Um, so it's uh, e to the 3k, and this time plus e to the minus k. Um, better write this out. In fact, in all those combinations, I just had e to the 3k and e to the minus k, except that now, because of sigma, one of them picks up a negative sign. Previously, because there was no sigma, none of them would become negative. One of them becomes negative. So I will get that. And of course, this has to be di divided by the value of Z0, which is e to the 3k plus 3e to the minus k.
And when sigma i is minus 1, it gives me a minus e to the power 3k plus e to the minus k minus 2e to the minus k divided by e to the 3k, 3e to the minus k. So I can combine all of them and write them like this. Because sigma i just multiplies a minus 1 in the bottom. It's a fraction because I have a z0 in the denominator. But is it a probability? Um, it's a probability, but only in the sense of h0. So I'm calculating the average of an operator in the h0, in the h0 model. Because they, they, are, uh, they are the opposite, so one has to be negative. Yes. See, let's go back here. I broke my Hamiltonian into a free, a, a free Hamiltonian plus interaction. So using this Hamiltonian, I will now do my calculations as though it is a statistical mechanical system. So I have a Z for this. And then I have averages of operators for this Hamiltonian. So this, if I have minus beta H interaction, it means that this is equal to minus beta H interaction, e to the minus beta H is 0, divided by Z0. So in this sense, you can say that each configuration is happening with a probability, and I'm summing them over. When I look at B minus beta H interaction, it's of this shape. This is H interaction. When I want to calculate the average value of this, I notice that Z I and J belong to different cells, and H0 does not connect the different cells. So each of them will have a separate, independent, or, or they, their averages can be calculated separately, which is what I have written here. So now, if, when I look at one of them, which is just the average value of sigma I, The problem is that what is the value of beta e to the minus beta h0 for each combination, which I had a table for. I write those values, but now with the difference that because sigma sometimes become negative and positive, some of them will pick up negative and positive factors. It simplifies into that. So this term will therefore be k, this ratio. Sigma i 
is equal to. However, for each neighborhood of a cell, there are actually two spins connecting this cell to the other cell. And each connection is equally valid, so I have a two to add here. And this is the, this is now the average of this interaction. There is a square power because each sigma i has one of these factors. So No, the average of sigma i equals to this if sigma i is equal to 1. But if sigma i is 1, I know that it is 1, so its average is the 1, it's determinate. Uh, no, uh, it's not the, uh, this term is not the average of sigma i itself. It is, it has minus beta h0 in there. This is what we are calculating. This is the ratio of sigma of small i. If you take a single cell in the block, yes. calculate the average sigma of that block, given that the block on the whole is plus one. Yes. So, so what is happening is that I take one of these blocks and there are three spins here, which can have, therefore, eight, eight possibilities. Out of these eight possibilities, one of them gives you sigma i plus one, and the other one gives you sigma i minus one. So four possibilities go into the calculation of sigma i plus one. And uh, therefore, this factor has to be calculated for each of the four possibilities. And this, there are four possibilities calculated to one, two, three, four. And then when sigma i is minus one, again these four possibilities have to be calculated. And as Professor Dar pointed out, four possibilities as you sum over the little sigmas. So it's, it's like it's a small i on the sigma in the so this i is not summed over. We have just for this sigma i is connected by sine of sigma 1, sigma 2, sigma 3. But all these sigmas, 1, 2, 3, belonging to block i. There are four possibilities. Four possibilities has gone into this. Yes, but on the, on the denominator, there is a zero, right? In the denominator, that factor of two that this guy pointed out. Yes, that factor of two is taken care of us because it is, uh, it's, you are right, there is a factor of two if you want to keep everything right. Now what we do is that we let go of that factor of two. We just work with this uh, value of log uh, of z zero. Eventually, all I want, what I want to do is to take log of this, and it will not be necessary. However, this other guy here is important in that 
the interaction, H interaction, H interaction actually has two terms in it because you get two, you get two spins connecting one cell to the other. But these two spins are just exactly the same and therefore the calculation doesn't affect it and I get if uh, it doesn't affect the calculation, I just get a factor of two here. And so if this average is like that, I can place it in this H interaction. I just place it in, in there. There is a K outside. This is the K outside. This is the term which comes out of one sigma type power two, so a squared for the whole term. So now this is interesting because it is telling me that HI is of the same form as H0. So if I can rub this off, I tell you what has happened as a whole. So I have a partition function which I wrote as a sum over i and then a sum over i, a small i, with the condition of sine of three spins giving me sigma i, sigma big i. This was broken into two parts. So I formed it into this shape. And I have now, and I then went on to calculate H of sigma i by performing some of this calculation and expanding in the powers of H interaction. And this is what I got. So I see that beta H sigma big I looks just like beta h sigma a small i, which is the, the, which is the point of renormalization group. Now I, can, now I can hope to extract my RG equations because this has coupling constants, this has coupling constants, and I can relate them to each other. So, so it, by writing e to the power k sigma i sigma j. The other thing which we need to notice here, which is implicit, is that if in the i j big i big j picture if they are not neighboring, there is no interaction. So this, this cell and that cell don't have an interaction. Only neighboring cells have. And it's a property of taking the first power. If you took the second power of the H interaction, then you might have interactions between further away cells. So this is now in, in this shape. Hence I can say that the new coupling constant 
is related to the old coupling constant by this formula. This is my RG equation. What does it say? It says by the blocker summation of Kadanov on a triangular lattice, the shape of the Ising Hamiltonian doesn't change, but the coefficient, the coupling constant changes, and the coupling constant changes by this law. So this calculation, although a little involved, gives me an answer to Michael Fisher that it's not really all that non-trivial, <laughs> although I have used a lot of tricks. He meant without using tricks. <laughs> So I'm going to rub everything off so that we now have an RG equation. And this RG equation has happened in making A go to root 3 times A. So a scale has been enlarged. As a result, coupling constant has changed. If you, if you like, you can say that these are coupling constants at different scales, and this is the result of changing the scale coupling constant changes as a result of the change of scale. It is not a differential equation as I showed you before because I have changed the scale by a finite amount, not by an infinitesimal amount. So first thing, I have to find the fixed points. Why do I have to find the fixed points? Because the fixed points correspond to the points of the flow where the Hamiltonian doesn't change. And if it, the Hamiltonian doesn't change, then... Um, I have a critical point. So what is the obvious fixed point? There is an obvious face fixed point at k a star equal to zero. k a star equal to zero, zero equals to zero is a fixed point. And then there is another fixed point at infinity, of course. For at, at finite interaction strength, these correspond to zero and infinity temperatures. So this is T equal to zero, and this is t equals to infinity. So this is, these are not interesting. So we now look for a fixed point in, the, in a finite fixed point, it's somewhere in the middle of these two extremes. So there must be a point where this equation is satisfied at a value between zero and infinity. Um, uh, 
a little algebra shows you that you can find this fixed point. Um, let's not do the algebra. K star, I have it here if somebody wants to see the algebra. Take a logarithm and then you jog a little. <laughs> now, you can immediately ask, is it correct or not? Because we know what K has to be from Onzaga's solution. Of course, Onzaga's for to, to, um, Rectangular, but a similar solution for triangular. We know the exact K star So you see, it's not that bad. We have about 0.06 of difference between the obtained result and the exact <laughs> It is uh, to actually validate this method, you have to do the next order of perturbation, which these guys did, the guys who I wrote their name down. And if you go to the second order of approximation, then this K star approximation comes out. So if I call this K star 1, that would be K star 2, will come out to be 0.3 something. And the approximation improves. I think 0.301 something. Um, so the approximation improves, which is the answer to your question, whether this is an, a, a perturbation or not. Only now I can say that it is, because you can see that the approximation com is apparently converging to the exact solution. Okay, what I can do next is to take a derivative of this term. Let's do this precisely. So k prime is a function of k. What I write it as k prime as a function of k star at and expand around here. However, k prime at k star is k star itself. Yeah, because that's the fixed point. And this equation can be re reorganized in this shape. So 
So what does it say? It says that the distance that the coupling constant has to the fixed point, the distance of the coupling constant as a result of each renormalization step is changes by this factor. It changes by this factor. So if I calculate this factor, it will give me the factor change of the coupling constant near the fixed point. So dk prime, dk at k star. This has to be calculated. Hmm? What is negative? Maybe you can tell me afterwards. I don't see any problem. Um, OK, this is a calculation which eventually gives you 0 0.883. So how do I interpret this 0 0.883? I'm asking you. It's a repulsive point. It's a repulsive point, but what is the exponent of repulsion? What I need to interpret this is as if you, if this is exactly like what I obtained in the, in the abstract RG, I said that this M stability is e to the power y1, e to the power y2, 0, 0. So this y1, this is y1. So not, 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 thank you very much, lambda to the power one. <laughs> thank you. Uh, so this, this guy is the delta T, is the repulsion in the direction of delta T. So, so that it's actually T prime is equal, sorry, beta prime is equal to E lambda to the power minus one beta. This, what this is interpreted as that. Now, ex I have exactly the same shape, but k prime is, re delta k prime is related to delta k with a coefficient. So this has to be equal to lambda to the power y t. This is the amount by which this coupling constant is rescaled as a result of arch. Exactly. I just want them to do a little thinking. They are not supposed to just listen. It's not a theater. <laughs> so what is lambda? Lambda is given by this relationship that A prime is root 3 times A. So this is my lambda. So yt is equal to log of 0 0.883 divided by log of root 3, which is approximately what? Sorry, I... Uh, Sorry. 
Sorry, a lot of errors here. A lot of errors here. One point six two four. One point six two four. O point eight eight three. And why t exact is equal to one. So this is not this is off by twelve percent, which is of course reflected in this as well. Now you can calculate one of the one of the exponents new is one over y t and that is equal to one point one three and it should have been one. And alpha is equal to 2 minus 2 over y t, which comes out to be minus 0 0.26, and it should be 0. And this is a uh, so you, you can, if you are. If you are, if if you are able to do the next order of uh, approximation, these things all improve. The next order of approximation is to keep the second power of interaction, Hamiltonian interaction, in there. Now, to complete the calculation, I have to also do the H. So I have a, a, a H S I which goes to an H prime S I prime. We'll do it tomorrow. Okay? Thank you.